So good afternoon. My name is uh, Santeri Kangas. I'm from Cujo. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my past. I'm going to talk about Cujo. I'm going to talk about Cujo product, and then I have uh, four tips on how to build uh, software in scale. Uh, you're not going to see any code today, uh, but you're going to see a sweep of different type of things that we figured out that make sense to put in place when building scalable IoT cloud security software. So I've been in the security industry for two and a half decades, 20 plus years in a company called F-Secure, running their security laboratory, building uh, security solutions for, for internet security and for teleoperators uh, as a CTO, working for Secunia vulnerability research company out of Denmark, uh, Flexera software, asset management, Omada identity and access management. Joined Cujo in the, the beginning of 2018. And what do we do at Cujo? We started from these. It's a smart firewall device, really a design product, if you may, an IoT device that you plug in to your home router. And it provides device identification, AI-based security, and uh, parental controls or digital parenting solution for your home. Now, IoT business is hard. It's hard to make profits unless you sell millions of devices. Figure that out pretty quickly. We sell that device in Amazon, in Best Buy, in the US, and in the UK. Now, two years ago, we shift gears. Those boxes you can still buy in the US market, but we shift gears to providing that same solution in a teleoperator routers. So these are the boxes that telias and the likes here in Lithuania bring to your home through which they provide the DSL connection and, and your home Wi-Fi. So today we are providing the solution for network operators, internet service providers of the world. We, are, we started from the US. So we have two biggest carriers in the US, which is Comcast and Charter Communication as, as our customers. These guys cover more than half of US households. That's like 55 million households in the United States. And we are rolling out our solution there. We are already in tens of millions of households. And, and we are expanding now to the European operator space. The router you saw there is from one of the big European operators. Now, we are still a startup. We, we have investors also, as teleoperators are also investing us, like KPN and Charter are our investors. We, we don't have any VC money, so uh, very healthy uh, from the board level. We are really serving uh, the network operators of this world. And there are like 300 of them globally. Now, those boxes, this particular one, I think is a Sajemcom, Sajemcom box. Uh, there are three vendors that are big in this market. Two of them you wouldn't know unless you have checked what is said behind the box at home. The Sajemcom European, Technicolor American, they are the Cisco home brand. They bought it. And then Huawei, which is the biggest globally. You might have Huawei routers. And the routers might be connected via DSL, via DOCSIS, via the cable, or via 4G, 5G. But that's the router that provides the internet in your home or in your small, medium-sized business. And these are the end customer segments for us. Now, this year we have got a lot of recognition. First, Gardner said we are a cool vendor went to watch in IoT security space. And Gardner is the biggest analyst company in the world. Then World Economic Forum gave us the Tech Pioneer of 2018 award. And just last week, the Global Telecoms Award came to us on the category of uh, security. So quite a good success this year. Now, what is Cujo as a, as a company? 
for our genes. So first of all, our CEO was born and raised here in Lithuania. He's, he's living in California at the moment, has been there, has studied there. We have more than 80, approaching 100 people here working in, in Lithuania. Uh, we have two offices, one that is just behind here on the glass towers on the Telia building, uh, and one in Kaunas. That's our other site here. In Kaunas, we do most of our cloud engineering. Some of our firmware engineering is done in both locations, and uh, a lot of our delivery and marketing activities happen out here from Vilna. Unless you recognize my accent, I'm, I'm not a Lithuanian. I'm, I'm a Finn. Uh, living outskirts of Helsinki. We have an office in Finland too. Uh, and then we have development sites also in, in Hungary. A lot of good mathematicians come out of there. And then in Rio, Brazil, of all places. And uh, I'll explain why Rio during my presentation. Now, let's look at the security landscape. I'm not going to talk about the latest attacks here, but I'm just going to talk what has changed in the security landscape during the last, say, three years. And it's driven by the IoT devices coming to our home. My wife went and bought a washing machine just a few weeks back. New Bosch washing machine. Gee, it has a Wi-Fi. Uh, so she can see from the kitchen that the washing machine has ended uh, and, and, and can start it from, from the living room or, or wherever. I don't, I don't know if it, or then I can monitor if it's doing the laundry while I'm here. So, so the IoT devices are pushing themselves to every uh, utility that we have. Uh, doorbells, baby monitors, surveillance cameras, your Sonos devices are IoT devices, your printers are IoT devices. In an average US household, and we do see what they have, because that old data is in our cloud systems, they have more than 22 devices in average, which means that some of them have like 30, 40. Some singles might not have that many. How many phones or laptops can you have? It's like two, maybe the third is what might be tablet, right? So, so all the rest is IoT devices. Now, the security industry has traditionally been good on protecting those devices. Well, some of you don't have. If you are Apple user, you might still believe on the scenario that Apple really doesn't need any security, but guess it does. Uh, the, the laptops, phones, yeah, there are endpoint solutions. All the rest, 20 devices, are out there all on their own. Now, from vulnerability business, we know that all of those, well, the IoT devices are running Linux, right? Uh, all different distributions. Uh, also, the router is running Linux, it's an OpenWRT. They have vulnerabilities. We as developers, we code good stuff, but we also leave some bugs behind. Uh, and then the product management says that, oh, no, 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 we need to release, just leave them behind. And some of you have good security practices, some of you have bad. California just did a law, enforced a law last month that IoT device manufacturers have to follow proper security models like SSDL or something like that, because there are so many vulnerabilities in IoT devices. Now, if you have a vulnerability, the device becomes potential target of an attack. Uh, the malware writers, the hackers, they need those vulnerabilities because they need to exploit the device, right? Your home devices have a lot of those potential exploit points, so it is pretty easy to take them over. Uh, have you patched? Who patches their home devices? Good. Brilliant. If you haven't patched them, it's like you would leave your computer unpatched or your phone not upgraded. Uh, and those sa the same stuff happens in IoT devices that happens in our, our smart devices. End of this year, there will be more than 10 billion of these devices out there. And they are populated across our home. And it's going to be just the exponential growth. Many of you are considering to buying some gadget. From the next salary, you probably want to buy something cool. I just bought the ring doorbell because I want to be able to see who is at my door. Uh, sometimes they are a bit expensive, but, but they are kind of sneaking in. So they are, they are coming in, and we haven't seen the peak of this yet. American households are leading the plot. They have the purchasing power, and, uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of advertisement going, so they are, they are buying. 
We have even seen expensive bicycles that have IoT device in them because uh, somebody wants to load their data straight from a bicycle to, uh, to some cloud service. Now, we have done some customer studies. People are worried out there. These are from consumer customers uh, globally. So 87% are concerned about personal data leakage. Well, personal data can leak from many places. Cloud services being probably the target number one, the second one being your, your devices, but your personal life might leak through the IoT devices. You might think that I have nothing to lose. Well, I don't know, the children might be, but, uh, but of course you have. As long as you have some monetary instruments, you have stuff to lose. Uh, that's why you lock your door, that's, that's why you put your stuff in a safe when you come to a hotel and so forth. You have stuff to lose. 77% uh, worry about unauthorized remote access. Now, you might think that the firewall in your home router is doing a good job uh, to a certain extent. When did you last check the firewall configuration of the box? Uh, if you are in IT company, uh, in IT department, you probably do quite regular checks on your Cisco Uniper firewalls. Uh, 30, uh, so 83% so prefer to know if these devices are vulnerable. So if, do I need to do something or not? Because the device is out there, it's sitting on its own, hooked to the ceiling, and you know nothing about it. It might be already taken over. Typically, you'll realize it when the device doesn't function anymore and you start debugging it. And you are engineers. Wonder if a grandmother in Alabama has any idea. You guys can figure it out still, right? She wouldn't. Now, this is what's happening to the big, well-prepared companies of this world. There's like Yahoo, eBay, Facebook, Uber. These are the security breaches during the last five years of a massive scale. Now, these guys are prepared. They have onion models in their security thinking, defense in depth, in-network vulnerability scanners, out-network vulnerability scanners, firewalls that are running firepower or something. They, they have uh, procedures. Uh, they have host-based intrusion prevention. They have uh, network intrusion prevention solutions. Their software engineering is running a process where vulnerabilities are tracked and so forth. Still, it happens. Now, the guys who hack these companies, they can hack 100 households before they have had their morning coffee, right? Because our households are not applying any of these strategies. And that's what we provide. Provide that extra layer on boundary of your home to protect and see if there is something going fishy going on inside your home, if you're connecting to something bad, and so forth. I'll come, in, come into that in a moment. So what do we offer? So there were three offerings. First one being device identification. And it's very advanced. This is our solution. We can detect in your home down to the operating system version of the device, including the brand, manufacturer, the what is it, what is the operating system, what is the version, the device. It's very interesting to see what you have in your home. Is it connected or not? When was it last connected? This is our competition, one of the biggest security companies in the world. You have no clue what they, what these devices are. MAC addresses, IP addresses, sometimes the name of the device. We, our technology is based on tracking all the connectivity of the devices, all the connections, where do they connect, what protocols they use, and we build device profiles. We have today 200 million devices in the biggest customer's environment, 200 million. That's a good enough data set for deep learning and, and machine learning to understand that, okay, now we see 10,000 of these cameras, this is how they behave in normal conditions. If they behave differently, the two options, they released, the software manufacturer released an update, added some functionality. We go and update the profile, but then general population will, of that device will get the update and, and, and we'll see the phenomena. 
Well, the other option is that it was taken over because it's talking on protocols or it's being talked to via protocols that doesn't don't belong there. So it's not, not just identifying, it's also the security. And on the security side, we do many other things. Like if you, if you have a botnet running in your house in one of the devices, the botnet requires connection to command and control server. Somebody is controlling it. We'll see that connection. We'll, we'll see it coming in or the device is going out. If, uh, if the device is connecting to so-called bad web, which the industry maintains a massive uh, URL, IP and DNS databases of what is the known bad at the moment, we detect that too. So we see that now this device is connecting to something that is known by earlier research to, to be bad. And if it's some space of the internet that we have never seen, we have no categorization of it, our URL checker that is based on machine learning will actually analyze five different vectors of, 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 of the, of the uh, five different features of the site, of the connection, to see whether we, we figure it out. And we do figure out immediately when we see a phishing site, that it is actually a phishing site, before it comes into, uh, into any of these lists. Digital parenting or parental control. Like when I was a kid, there was no need, there was no internet. My older sons, who are now in university, they used to surf web. So kind of web classification has been there for a while, for more than 10 years, saying that, okay, these are adult sites, these are gambling sites, kids shouldn't go there. And that's what parental control in classic terms is. And guess what? The kids are now using apps, no longer browsers. My youngest one, I think she, he, he's never seen a browser, but he's a native in, in Netflix and uh, on their tablet, and he's pretty young. I don't want him to accidentally enter any, any sites that don't belong into his radar. If he opens the browser on, on a tablet, like unless it's a safe browser of some security company, he opens the Chrome, like uh, there's not enough protection over there. And the apps absolutely have no protection whatsoever. So what we do, we detect the apps. And we detect also how long the kid uses the app. Is it in the foreground or is it in the background? I'll show you uh, later on what does it look like on a network when the app is in the foreground and when it's in the background. Uh, because digital parenting is all about what do I want my kids to do in the internet? How many hours of social media? How many hours of streaming media? That's what parents want to do. It's not like you want to control and enforce. It's more like you, you, uh, for the older children, it's like more you want to know what they're doing and have a family discussion about it. Now, we had a head start on the technology, and you can see it from our awards. So how does it work? So we have these smart homes, smart home devices and, and, and then the smart devices in home. We have the firewall, smart firewall running inside the operator's or ISP's router, and then we have a cloud service. Now, this is a tough place. There's 20 megs of memory in average free. Uh, we work in gigabit routers. You're not allowed to slow down it below 700 megs a second in the US because that's what they compete with and there's only a certain amount of CPU that, that we have left in the router because these are pretty cheap boxes that they're bringing to you. So all the heavy lifting is done in the cloud for us. Now, our technology cornerstones is that we, we are in the data path. Uh, we are not actually only on the router, we are also on the, uh, we have, I'm not gonna go through that, but we are in the internet backbone uh, or, or out of home experience uh, through apps also when you go out of home, but we're talking about home protection today. Then we have uh, efficient transport. So we are talking about 11 kilo kilobits per second that the router is talking to the cloud all the time. And there are like millions, tens of millions of these devices connecting to our cloud. And in the cloud, we run trained algorithms that do the job of detecting and signaling back to the device. So the enforcement point is here, but the decision point is here. There's multiple layers of caching on the way. If, it, if we know already something and the household has already served that space of the web, 
that's already here. Uh, if somebody has touched that part of web already from our customer base, it's already cached here. We have a 100 millisecond uh, response time promise to our customers that we respond. Now, how do we orchestrate uh, an engineering organization from technical and from process side? Because to build large-scale successful products, and this might be a disappointment for the young engineers, the older ones know this already, it's not just how good you are on hacking. How many developers we have here? How many product managers or managers on engineering? How many leaders in the companies? So are the rest admin? Or housekeeping? Okay, a bit shy. Don't, no worries. But the developers sometimes feel that, okay, they do brilliant stuff, but it never ends up appreciated. So successful company needs to link people, processes, and technology. So, because the challenges that our engineers are facing, they are multiple. In our case, we have increasing number of customers, a lot of feature requests coming in, increasing number of firmware platforms. I mentioned three. We're actually at the moment working with six, uh, and they all have multiple different variants. Linux version 2.x to 4.x, uh, four different middle layers, uh, different Linux variants, increasing number of development teams. Um, you saw already we're quite diverse uh, in our distribution. At the same time, the sales wants to sell faster, they want us to deploy faster because we want to get fast path to revenue. If you are in a startup, this is the reality. This is the big picture of it. So what we have built, and uh, really the core of it is, if you have, if you're building software, you're building it for the end consumer, right? Or enterprise. You might have a channel customer like we have, service provider. That's who we are building the software for. So the engineer who's building the software has to get this, right? He ha the, the, the whole thing needs to flow smoothly. So our process, we have fine-tuned it to speed and business focus, visibility governance, and enabling the organization. We are running a very traditional, well, you could say that this is the safe model of Dean Leffingwell adjusted to our business. If you don't know that, check safe. Uh, but it's the traditional. We have themes, we have features like parental control or security, which is breakdown to portfolio items, uh, breakdown to solution designs of different versions, uh, prioritized on team backlogs, and then we use the release train to pull it all out. Now, w speed and business focus come from the fact that Whatever is designed over here, it gets with the right priority to the developer's table. Developers also invent a lot of stuff. And this has been a problem when I joined Kuja. The guys were inventing so much that it was really, s the machine was stuck because they had good ideas. Some pr appreciated, some not, uh, because there was no full visibility and governance. And engineers come up with a lot of things that should end up to an architecture runway Everybody should know, and then we should make a decision whether we do that change of a component from uh, traditional to lambda functions, like we ho heard just a moment ago, now or next month or, or next year, uh, because it's, it, there's a business driver. Releases need to go out. For this, we need to enable the organization to make decisions on each level after we have reached visibility governance and the business focus goes through. This is bit of a hebrew I, I know. So what we did, we built a gearbox. Now, I'm a fan. The number one sport for us is Formula One. Everybody knows Kimi Raikkonen, right? The guy has like hundreds of horsepowers behind his back. But sometimes he loses. And many times it's because, and sometimes it's the gearbox. If you drive with a gear number one, 500 horsepowers behind your back, you go to the pit stop. There's no way you can win the race. There's no win you can win in the competition if all the engineering power you have is not properly geared, right? 
So this is the Kujo gearbox. It starts from the CEO. We have a, we're running an agile enterprise model. It's not just agile development team. It's not agile product management. It's agile enterprise. So we have a portfolio steering group that meets weekly basis, looks at the business priorities at the, at the week, sorry, here. And we have a portfolio board that is the company level board. What are we going to do? What is in works? What is in uh, analysis? What is in roadmap? Architect steering group, which is collection of lead engineers from each team, meet there and say, okay, we have, a pr we have this feature or this challenge. One of them prepares, all of them talk, might argue, should argue. If engineers don't argue, there's something wrong in the organization. For those that are not from engineering or who are from HR, they are supposed to argue. Because engineers can only agree when all the facts are on the table and all the options are being analyzed, right? And that's the architect steering group that feeds back to the portfolio board. Now, product owners are building then the feature area backlogs, which go into the scrum teams or Kanban teams. We are not religious. Both work. Courses for horses uh, and, and different cultures. Brazilians say Scrum doesn't work, so they use Kanban. Here, Scrum works better than Kanban. Our DevOps team says that it needs to be Kanban and so forth. So we're not uh, religious. At the end, every team, every two weeks, is supposed to release a tested artifact that is ready to go to the final testing to the market. So that's the team delivery. And you see a lot of circles here, because engineering processes are cyclic. You know that when you have done a release, you go to the office next morning, and the thing starts again, all over again, right? It's a never-ending story. Uh, so there is a launch team and release team. And of course, there's a triage. Bugs come in. We need to put them into the next sprint. And there are li whip limits on how much bugs we fix and so forth. But this gearbox, it's vital for our success. Now, the second tip, this doesn't work without continuous integration, continuous testing, and continuous delivery. So, uh, what we are, what this is our target for this year, because we realized that operating and running the clouds, and we're running multiple, because we put an instance for each operator. Somebody might ask, why are you not multi-tenant? Well, because we're processing so toxic PII information that it shouldn't exit the teleoperator's control. So we are, we are deploying actually tens of these cloud instances out there, and we need to keep them in the, in the same versions, preferably. So we use infrastructure as a code. There are good presentations on this. In this uh, event, I, at least I saw the agenda. So it is source-controlled definition of immutable cloud environment, which means that the whole environment is in the Terraform code. And we use Terraform for this. If you haven't checked Terraform, go and check. And there are good uh, libraries which provide reference architectures where you can get a default AWS environment up in, a, in seconds, basically. Our goal this year is that our CEO, who is a marketing guy, a very tech-savvy marketing guy, I would say, we'll have to deploy our cloud, OK? So there's not too much that he can change, or could change in the deployment. Uh, so uh, the, the movement that we are now in is moving to containers. To eliminate the configuration management hassle uh, and get the repeatability. So it's Docker and Packer. CI-CD pipeline is important when building the containers or when building the infrastructure as a code. Now, we're running microservices. Some of you might know Kujo. You might know that we have started the Java user groups in Kaunas and Vilnas. Kesta Saul is very active on that area. They build the microservices. Yeah, there are microservices. The services are using infrastructure elements like Cassandra, Spark, Nginx clusters. You name it, we probably have tried it out and, and, and picked our choice. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about the orchestration, how you deploy all of that. So microservices running containers. And then we can do choices whether we use, and we use Google and AWS, we are agnostic. Whether you use the platform as a service from the, from the cloud vendor 
or whether we deploy our own open source uh, stack of the, of the same kind. And that's more like an operational dis decision. Do we want to operate it and a cost decision, whether it makes sense from, uh, from financials. Now, the second point I want to make is the engineering. Now, developers are supposed to test their stuff. This is, this is the, what the developers are doing. The QE should do the end-to-end -end testing. The goal is to automate the tests. Who automates the tests? Good. Rest of you. That's very, very, very important. Uh, we're measuring uh, the level of automation in our in our testing. So, and it should engineers build the master package, right? The build system does it. Uh, in our case, Team City does it. Uh, then we run unit system acceptance and compliance testing. Get a stable package. And we're on a journey here, but those should be all automated. That goes to QA. In this kind of system, you always have to do some manual work, sometimes a lot of manual work in the quality assurance side. The quality is built over here. It's just tested over there. But they run these tests that are more complicated, like uh, failover tests, like uh, performance tests, uh, uh, deploy it to the first preview environment, upgrade tests to get a super stable package that can go to the production. You should, it's not just regression. You should automate all of this. Now, infrastructure as a code, deployment pipeline. So we're using Kubernetes. Uh, we build with Helm charts and, uh, and push those containers to chart repo. It all starts from GitHub. Uh, it goes to the container images push them to the red repositories, run the system tests against those deployments, commit images to the infrastructure live level, and then just deploy. And this is the command you need to give to deploy a tested version in staging. Staging is the last rehearsal before production. So you should have dev environment, the end-to-end -end test environment, staging and production environment in minimum. So those who here are responsible for for engineering budgets, and the guys come and say, we need more environments, give it. Give it to them. They need at least four, uh, of which the last one only is the production environment. This should be the same deployment, just different configuration than what goes to the production. It's the same command, it's just different target. When you do it with infrastructure as code, you can reach this. Let's move on. The third tip. Now, this is Netflix PCAP visualization of the protocol communication that Netflix app has when it's doing its job. So this is a human uh, build uh, training set for machine learning. That's WhatsApp. Visually very different. If I showed you 10 of these, you would be able to tell which one is which by just looking at the image. Uh, this axis here is time and what the engineer has done, and this is uh, mapping of, uh, of the different protocols being used. You can't see which endpoints it's using, which ports, uh, except that the color reflects the, the, the protocol. Now, this is when the application is not in use. It's on the background, but that happens in the background. The application has a heartbeat. So this is what we do first in the machine learning side when we are training uh, our, our engines. Now, I'm showing you the standard way of, uh, of applying machine learning and having a laboratory of supervised learning behind it. It doesn't start here. It starts actually a bit early. You need to choose your algorithms. I'm going to show you a couple of samples of the algorithms we use by name. But once you have a machine learning in production, you need to have a lab that trains the model. This is just an algorithm here, trained model. This is like 20% of the work. That's the cool stuff. That 80% 80 is hard work. Not typically done by data scientists. Those guys who know everything about advanced algorithms. This is done by analysts with the data. So what we do, we get the raw captures. Uh, we ha have the raw data. So we do scrollers or 
or our environments to do that, then we have a human supervised labeling. In this kind of business, we can do human supervised. We get also some from customers. If you're doing a weather forecasting service, you don't need humans because you have historic data from the sensors which tell how the phenomena worked. But in many cases, you need this. And this is a lot of work. You get the sterile data. Like this is like, we know what the data is. We're 100% sure it's right because it's important before you push it to the training. Then we pass it, extract the features, and build the model. Feature engineering is important part because when you have data, you have to choose which features from the data you actually are going to use in your model. And there's a lot of iterations that our ML team goes through when they are, when they are doing that. Now, that all work ends as, as a classifier into production. Okay, that's the classified, trained model. And this loop goes on. If the phenomena doesn't change, it doesn't need to change, then we don't update the classifier, but it tends to move a bit. Uh, in the production, we get content. We get a lot of content from these boxes coming to the cloud. We parse it, get the raw data vectors, which are fed to feature extractor, which gets the process data vector. And that's fed to the, to the machine learning. This is like Spark stuff. And the algorithms are there. We use Python and we use Java. There's also R that you can use. And uh, if you're using cloud services, like AWS, Google, Azure, which is actually pretty good on this, they provide all the algorithms of the box. You don't need to really program algorithms anymore. You get them either from Python, Java, or R, or then you can take them straight from the toolkits of those vendors. Now, we, we visualize our data. Uh, just to explain it, this is uh, we also do text-based analysis of uh, messages that the kids send. We categorize them based on type of messages that they are. These green circles here are messages about drugs after it comes out of the model. Uh, and this is just plotted on the two dimensions. It actually has third dimension. There are some dots that are on that. They are actually in the third dimension. This is how the model is visualized. Now, when the message, new message comes in in production and the features have been extracted and it's put to the model, if it hits here, we do a decision. It's a message about drugs. If it hits here, it's just neutral message. Okay. This requires a lot of training. So what do we use in device identification? So non-linear support vector machines are good on processing uh, data that where we're seeking for relevant looking fingerprints. So it's a back-end thing for us and we actually do very effective fingerprints which don't require the model in the production, but we use it to build those. Application detection, uh, we have a proprietary stuff over there. Well, pretty much the same story. These are considered as ML. Now, artificial intelligence is a bit different. It requires uh, models that, like convolutional neural network and long short term memory LSTM networks, which are in multiple levels, they learn, right? They, we have 50 levels of a uh, of a convnet here, for example, in our models. These require a lot of data, a lot of data, uh, typically millions of, of samples, because otherwise you can't train the network. Now we use uh, gradient boosting machines uh, to draw, draw decisions from uh, already prepared data. They're good on that. They're decision-making trees living next to each other through which the, which, the, which the logic goes through. Uh, so we run out the conclusions on web classifications with them, but for example, when we are processing images on a website, and phishing sites have a lot of images, we use convnets. Right? Digital parenting, all this text-based analysis, uh, are with the long, short-term memory networks. You are actually running this on a daily basis if you have Apple or Google device. Your device is running this. Anything that you talk to Siri or Google speech to text runs this stuff. It's very good on processing sequences, like human language. But any other sequences could be used too. In a company like, uh, like, like ours, 
we have a one team of data scientists. It's, it's, it's enough experts of who are working with the algorithms. We have three teams of laboratories working with the data. They day in day out basically so when you are starting to apply machine learning you need to craft that into your your plan and budget but they they can do a lot of miracles for you because then you don't have to build rule based things in in, in your systems if you are processing a lot of data now the last point and i i know we we started late how much do we have maybe a few minutes which I want to advocate and, and talk about. Uh, fourth tip, if you're doing, how many C programmers here? Oh, okay. Well, then this is great because when we are building stuff for Linux kernel on a network level driver, what we have built is architecture called NF Lua, NetFilter Lua, which runs on the Linux kernel uh, and analyzes the packet traffic that the, the router is getting in. Now, complex stuff, PCAP, we're, we're, we're running daemons over there, which are in Lua. Uh, and uh, Lua is a language which was developed in Book University in Rio, Brazil. That's why we are in Brazil, right? Uh, we have a team that is coming from that uni. We had a Lua workshop here in, in Kaunas, actually, just two months ago. Roberto, who is the father of Lua language, was here. Lua is used in many places. Your phone runs Lua. When it bootstraps, the bootstrapper is Lua, most likely. When you play games, the game engine is running Lua. If you need to program rules and you want it to be very, very portable, light, safe execution, you want to control it well, Lua is a good option. So why we chose it? Uh, and now it's a bit of a self-prophecy because we have a team doing it. Uh, there's a, it's flexible. It's easy to deploy once you have the runtime environment. It's portable. We have like six projects going on, all porting the same logic. They don't touch Lua because they just port the framework. Our business logic is intact, regardless of which box it runs. So if you are building IoT devices or software that has to be on multiple devices and have a lot of logic, it's a good, good choice. Uh, it also fails safe. It's safe to run in the kernel. Uh, it has memory management, uh, sandboxing. It's a fully isolated environment, so we don't crash the kernel if we have a logical problem in the Lua. Kernel updates for these routers might take 3 to 12 months to get through in, a, in an operator environment. Updating our Lua engine inside the kernel, totally different story. So there's NF Lua, which has Lua inside. NF Lua is NetBSD packet filter on layers 3 and 4, supports IPv6, and uh, we are open sourcing this. Uh, we're already giving it to our our vendors, and soon we're gonna gonna give it to the Git repo. We just have to do some cleaning before we do. Last cool thing about Lua, it's very light. Gu guys who build cloud services, you talk about megabytes or tens of megabytes of stuff. This is 240 kilobytes of an engine. You can put it anywhere. So it's almost freestanding. Very little tax. It's designed for industrial automation systems originally. If you take a metro train, Heathrow Airport, Lua is probably controlling the train's movements. That's why it was designed. It's fast, it's near real time, and that's why we chose it. That's all I had to say today. Any, any, I have time for questions, any questions? Privacy. How about privacy? Yeah, we are in EU, EU GDPR, big thing. Uh, we are ISO 27001 certified. Our operations is going through the SOC 2. Now, yeah, there is information about IP endpoints 
that the users connect in our cloud system. With yeah, 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 yeah. So this system that we have can be compared to the text message system that you are using here, for example, from Telia. Because we are running, that system is not run by Telia, by the way, it's run by Ericsson uh, in the outskirts of Helsinki. They are operating it. We are doing the same. We are, operate, we are providing the software stack, the instance, and we are operating it, but the data is operator's data. It doesn't exist the system. We only sa take sanitized information out for the learning purposes. So we don't see any PII data outside of that. So our systems are considered as telecom core infrastructure systems. And that's why we are deploying like that uh, them to the... But that's, that's a brilliant question. Okay, other question. Another brilliant question. How do we filter the content if TLS is applied? So we do track, we don't do deep packet inspection. We track the connections. On TLS, you don't see the full URL path. You see the DNS, you see, you see the connection uh, attributes. Yes, so most of our logic is based on the connections. Uh, and in these kind of routers, when they are in a gigabit scale, like this, we have about 12 packets in the beginning. Once these have so-called mechanism fast path, when the streaming starts, we're not interested. We're not interested on the stream, when you start streaming video, for example. Uh, because it does actually it goes to a fast path. These routers are optimized for speed. We see the connect connections being established. And, uh, and there are certain protocols that reveal quite a bit of us f to us, which are, uh, are key to our, our intellectual property. But we do track a dozen of things uh, and dozen of different protocols uh, going in. Uh, TLS handshake is very interesting for us, for example. And, and then the information that that reveals, because it's not just what's happening there, it's the information we have for example, of the certificate, it's lifetime, the reputation. So there's a lot of reputation calculation going on in the, in the background. Very good question. Okay, thank you very much.